Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to just take 10 minutes just to give some feedback on the ethics exercise. Just to say, if there is anything on the slide that doesn't seem like it resonates with what happened in your group, you just come and see me. That's happened before. I'll just make changes to it before, I, before we send it out to everybody. Um, right. So as you remember, this was a multi-center um, trial, and we had seven research ethics committees. It was a pre-submission meeting to debate some of the um, ethical concerns so that by the time the protocol actually came to that REC, the, their position on certain things would be to the liking of the REC. So I'm going to start with some of the um, scientific issues, even though this isn't the, the, the order in which you were asked to consider them. So all the RECs, if you just look at the blue, seem to question the exclusion of high-risk groups. So then, in other words, they have concerns about relevance and diversity. It seems like almost all the RECs were judging that the proposed enrollments didn't reflect enough social value for the setting. Um, and there needed to be um, an expanded um, inclusion criteria for the setting, and that that would reflect better knowledge gains for that setting. There were also a range of helpful suggestions around the design, which I've included, but I'm not going to read them here. In terms of other, this is sort of like a waste paper basket type um, cluster that you were asked to consider at the end. Was there anything else that was of concern to the RECs? Many RECs had some concerns around post-trial access. So the sense was that perhaps for a phase three trial, this didn't, this didn't reflect enough detailed planning for a phase three study. Some international guidelines argue that for phase one studies, for example, you wouldn't need a plan with as much detail, but there should be a progressive amount of planning as you achieve more and more success with that product. There were also some suggestions around post post-trial access with RECs really wanting more of a plan around how would results go back to, to um, community stakeholders. As you'll know, in some vaccine trials, the only success is around the knowledge. There is no product to be disseminated. So this is really around making recommendations that people that make these indispensable contributions to the study should have some feedback. And there were also a range of other recommendations. In terms of stakeholder engagement, almost every single research ethics committee was in favor of having a formalized mechanism or structure for ongoing liaison throughout the study. Um, and this is, in fact, I didn't show you this on the, in the slide on, on Saturday, but in fact, this is highly consistent with WHO recommendations to have community advisory boards for COVID vaccine studies. And I can send that document to you. So this is the idea that you really do need a mechanism for ongoing advice and support across the trial. Some um, research ethics committees worried about compensation and whether that would is always a concern that if you compensate CAB members for their time, for example, you want to still be able to preserve the independence of their voice. And that is quite important because they are supposed to not be co-opted by, by, by trials. There were also a range of very good suggestions. At the bottom, these two IRBs suggested a, a broader stakeholder engagement plan should be submitted for consideration. This is consistent with international guideline recommendations. Um, I would just suggest when vaccine studies are going to submit a stakeholder engagement plan to an IRB, that they try to balance um, enough transparency for the IRB to weigh in with flexibility in the field. You don't want to be so detailed that you need to change things down the line and now you have a protocol, TV, uh, you need to do a protocol amendment. The recommendations for consent were many and they were really very, very sound. Um, if you just focus on the one slightly in blue, so almost all of the IRBs um, or all of the IRBs and RECs recommended that there needed to be a formal assessment of understanding. So in other words, they, they objected to the fact that there would be no efforts to assess understanding of prospective uh, trial participants. There was some diversity about how that best would be done. But again, if I was the PR looking at trying to reconcile these, this feedback, this is not um, a terrible stretch for the team. It probably means some sort of hybrid approach to an assessment of understanding, perhaps co uh, combining 
questionnaires with some open-ended questions and train staff. So these were really good suggestions. And if you look at the very bottom, stakeholder engagement is not only an issue on its own, but it's sort of a golden thread that goes through all the other other ethical issues. And here we see um, that some IRBs wanted to see consultation with community experts to improve consent forms and processes. Recommendations for the standard of prevention. So all RECs recommended education. So in other words, that um, prospective participants must be educated about how to uh, prevent COVID. But the majority also wanted the direct provision um, of preventative methods. So in other words, masks and hand gels. So they didn't think intuitively that telling people about them was adequate. The team needed to go further than that and actually reduce barriers to accessing those preventative measures and providing them. Um, this is consistent with, with international guideline recommendations. And again, they seemed intuitively to the idea that there shouldn't be too much disparity across sites on this particular issue. The PR might need to clarify with two of the ILBs what their stance was on this issue. Recommendations for ancillary care, in other words, how far should researchers go to help participants who acquire COVID? And of course, the case introduced the idea that it wasn't going to be equal across sites, so really setting up attention for you there. Most um, RECs did um, make similar recommendations here. Five of the ILBs seemed not satisfied with merely a referral strategy to the local standard. And they, they seem to be um, um, arguing that research, the study team would need to go further than merely referring to the local standard. Um, so they wanted to see extra, extra steps, if you like. So the procurement of the antivirals, making sure that there was access to um, ventilation, for example. Two of the IRBs, and this is where I may have this wrong because I was trying to, I wasn't present in all of the, the groups. They were considering whether referral to the local standard or something slightly better than that would be an acceptable strategy. So here, I think the uh, the PR that would be uh, would the PR would probably have to reach out to those two IRBs and just make sure that they could understand what the recommendations were that were that were being made. Was it that referral to the local standard would be acceptable, or should it be more than that? This is usually the issue around which there's the most. Of, um, strife across ethics committees. This is the most consistency I've ever seen um, in terms of payment guidelines. So largely, most of the ILBs were arguing that there should be um, payment for expenses. In other words, that it would be wrong for trial participants to, um, to have the burden of costs to be in a vaccine study, that that really um, would be unfair. But over and above that, there should be payment for time. So this is really highly consistent. Uh, these recommendations are highly consistent with the SEONS guidelines recommendations and the wage payment approach. Um, I'm assuming that most IRBs would have been happy with a cash payment. Um, some IRBs sometimes want an in-kind payment, where it's not cash, but it's something to the equivalent value. That wouldn't necessarily be consistent with guidelines or the, or the international guideline approach. And if that's the case, then you'd really just want to probe why they felt that adults should not be receiving a cash payment, um, why you would want to be protecting them in a way from cash. So just to say if I was the PI, despite the fact that this was a multi-center review, multi-IRB review, which can make PIs quite grumpy, I would think that in the main, these are fairly consistent recommendations. They're helpful. They're guideline grounded, which I think is really fantastic. And I think that here you would have got feedback from a diverse range of ILBs in a way that is actually quite helpful. It builds up quite a rich picture under each of those ethics recommendations. So I think this would have been quite beneficial. And it certainly validates um, the engagement strategy of having a pre-submission meeting. Um, and I, I really think that as a PR, that would have been a really validated. That approach would have been really validated. And from the participants and the facilitators, I've had so much feedback. People really got so stuck into this meeting. And there were some terrifyingly good activists. And I just want to say thank you so, so much for your participation. Thank you.